Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 94, recorded November 4th, 2010. Best Farmville Netbooks. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by the AARP Auto Insurance Program from the Hartford. Discover great rates, benefits, and service specifically designed for AARP members at aarp.thehartford.com slash podcast. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware. I'm Patrick Norton. Joining me as always, the man, the myth, the legend, the founder of PCPer.com, Mr. Ryan Shrout. I am at least one of those things. <laughs> You're at home, dude. This is exciting. <laughs> Uh, I think we uh, all of our pre-show talk was about food and, and, and that kind of stuff. I think we're going to move past that and maybe Chick-fil-A, talk about hardware for a little bit. Steak so. and Shake. I forgot to mention In-N-Out, another regional burger chain. That talk is good. Yourselves. It's one of those things I like to get when I'm out there. But In the chat room. It's good stuff. Although it I, would like to see, I would like to see Steak and Shake out here so I can get a Chili Mac. Uh, more importantly, I would like to share with everyone the first news story of the day. Uh, Ars Technica did a big, big, big set of testing on the MacBook Air, the 11.6-inch device. And it's interesting because Apple apparently has stopped bundling Flash with the MacBook Air. Big mm-hmm. shock, right? Steve hates Flash. That's why they kill it. Turns out... Uh, flash, because of the flash ads is causing the CPU so much, the Ars Technica folks say that it's dropping battery life by as much as two hours. Chris Forsman over at uh, Ars Technica was doing the testing on that one. Dropping battery runtime as much as 33%. Yeah, it was pretty, it was, it was an interesting, it's almost like he mentions it in passing in the article, too. Mm-hmm. Um, it, on, on one of the pages, I mean, his, his, his quote is, having Flash installed can cut battery runtime considerably by as much as 33%. With a handful of websites loaded in Safari, Flash-based ads kept the CPU running far more than seemed necessary. And the best time I recorded with Flash installed was just four hours after deleting Flash. The MacBook Air ran for six hours. Um, with the exact same websites loaded in Safari, apparently, but with uh, static ads replacing the, quote, CPU-sucking Flash versions. I, I, I know Flash ads suck CPU, and it was actually one of the reasons I upgraded my wife's machine, because it was an older core duo, and mm-hmm. as soon as she got it, you know, a couple dozen web pages loaded, you would hear the fan crank up, the thing would run hot, you could keep your coffee warm on top of it, but mostly I was tired of hearing the fan running 24 hours a day while her computer was on if a couple web pages were open, because it seems like as, as resource-intensive as Flash is, and I don't think anybody's going to argue that it isn't, um, it's even worse on older it seems to be getting worse over time as the video or other elements they're displaying or the code just gets sloppier but yeah 30 percent performance suck um i wouldn't have thought that cpu even ramped up the cpu on the culv would be that Mm -hmm. power intensive so that says a lot about optimizing um you know what i mean is it worse it makes me wonder like is it worse uh on on os 10 than it is on windows have they done better optimization on windows it's a good question because now I want to like go and like start sh- uninstalling Flash on things and seeing if my you know my my machine lasts longer. It's um, a good idea. One yeah. of the other things that came up with with me here is, <clears throat> I know on the PC, with Nvidia and ATI GPUs, and then the the MacBook Air has an Nvidia GPU, that there is general purpose Flash acceleration, right. on. Uh, on, on not just like Flash video, but across all Flash applications, including advertisements and all that kind of thing, right. all those kinds of things as well. So I wonder if that acceleration is not working properly on, on Mac OS, mm-hmm. you know, it, that that would be causing this. Because, I mean, you should see some CPU increase from it, but I, I wouldn't imagine that it would be as dramatic as it had been in the past if you have Flash 10.1 and, and all that <laughs> kind of stuff and, and that those accelerations are actually enabled and working on that platform. It's kind of confusing, but yeah, I thought the same thing. It's like, I want to go like test this machine that I use every day with it and without it and see uh, if it's as dramatic as this or if it's one of those things where, look, we're in an Apple ecosystem, in an Apple kind of world, and these things just magically happen that way, that Flash turns out to be as bad as Steve Jobs 
tends to think it is. Maybe he thinks <laughs> that because obviously the only thing he uses is Mac. Um, maybe it is that bad for him all of the time. And that's well, why he has such I mean, a pathetic it makes me... Yeah, it literally, it makes me, I've got a couple of, of relatively fresh no, uh, PC notebooks, Windows notebooks around here, and it really does make me want to uninstall Flash and see if I see a boost in performance. But yeah, it also makes me wonder if maybe the wrong version of, and and, and this is nothing, because I'm not trying to say anything against Chris Foreman or the testing at Ars Technica, because right. those guys do some beautiful work over there. Uh, but, nope. but wouldn't it be funny if like the wrong version of Flash was loaded, or if the version of Flash that's available that does uh, NVIDIA acceleration wasn't working? with that particular GPU. Um, yeah. But yeah, 30% power drop, that's just brutal. Brutal, brutal, I mean, brutal. I, I'm usually a defender of Flash and defender <laughs> of having these open uh, platforms that can run anything and, and uh, Apple's disregard for right. uh, the Adobe products and that kind of stuff. But it's just, if this is true and this is, you know, 100% um, reproducible with all these different right. revisions and drivers. You know, if it's not a driver bug from NVIDIA or a software bug from mm -hmm. uh, Apple or something, then this does give a lot of credence to the thought of maybe Flash is just too bloated to be uh, <laughs> reliably installed on these kind of lower-end machines. Yeah, lo lower end being a, a core duo with four gigabytes of RAM. In my wife's case, I, I'm 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 not calling that low end, dude. Not even a little it, bit. I mean, you gotta think it's a it's a two gener <laughs> it's a two generation old processor with a three or four generation old GPU in it. Um, I mean, it's still good for its form factor, for its uh, not really for its price, but for its form factor and and battery life and all that kind of stuff. But in terms of CPU and GPU technology, it's still a little bit behind. Two right? years. Uh, I mean, come on, dude. Should should your well, Core Two Duo should is not two years old. Core Two Duo well, is like four. But Core Two Duo is like four, but like a you know a, a two point seven gigahertz Core Two Duo. I'm not considering that a particularly aging, long in the tooth CPU. And it's not like right. the Core i five performance is that much better than it. I don't know. I guess what I'm saying is like the the back end technology that powers advertising shouldn't be crushing notebooks. That I will yeah. agree with. Um, I don't know. Speaking of crushing, Intel LightPeak. Is Intel LightPeak going to prevent USB 3.0 from gaining any kind of traction? You know, at, when, when this first started to come about, I would have said no. I would have thought USB 3.0 implementations would have been uh, further along than they are now, and that we would be further away from LightPeak implementations than we apparently are, according to this article uh, over at CNET that says uh, it should be appearing in products in the first half of 2011. Um, it says likely earlier in the year than later. So that's, uh, that's a good, good indication, at least, that, that we might see light peak products demonstrated at CES. We might see, you know, laptops with implementations and that kind of stuff. I mean, honestly, I mean, since, since IDF happened in September, it wasn't even really kind of a big push there. I don't think during any of the keynotes Light Peak was mentioned more than in passing, which had it if it had a huge draw behind it, I would have thought they would have made a bigger deal about it than they did. Um, I mean, it, it seems funny because we, we had a question on, on Techzilla this week about somebody was like, well, you know, there seem to be several competing USB 3.0 IEEE specs. And I'm like, well, there's a USB 3.0 spec. It's done by the USB implementers, you know, forum. It's out. The products are in the market. They're demonstrated. You know, the, the spec's been set for like two years. The products are in the market now. If you do a lot of data transfer or backup, because, you know, PC per, you know, you, you were like the, Ryan, you were like the person who really made me realize that USB 3.0 is here. Yep. You know, it's like an Asus card, I drop it in my Core i7 machine, then all of a sudden like, I'm, I'm getting like 5, 6x performance on a drive by dropping it into a USB 3.0 uh, adapter. And that's like, that's awesome. I'm into that. Now I want my iPhone to somehow magically, <laughs> magically become USB 3.0, which is not going to happen. No. Um, because, you know, it's funny because the article, uh, the CNET article, was basically pointing out like, well, you know, there's you know, the question mark around Apple adoption. And, oh, yes, Intel still hasn't integrated it into any of its chipsets. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, oh. <laughs> that, that's, that's actually the key to, to USB 3.0 right. and its kind of slow adoption is that I, I don't know if maybe internally Intel decided mm -hmm. that they were going to skip USB 3.0. Uh, right. and push light peak or if it's really an issue of their chipset release schedules just 
haven't caught, we haven't had a chipset release since USB 3.0 has really started to come out. So right. maybe it's just a matter of things not matching up. And by the time they get these new chipsets ready for early January, when the Sandy Bridge uh, processors launch, that they will in integrate both USB 3 and Light Peak, which is what I would like to see done. Um, but I, yes. if, if they if they release new chipsets and they have neither, and they're saying, well, Light Peak is still a few months away, that's really going to be aggravating because USB 3.0 right. is easy to implement. It's 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 really yeah. small logically and all that kind of stuff. And there's no reason right. other than wanting to promote their own standards um, like what? to leave it out. Four or five extra wires use the same basic. It basically takes up the same amount of space on the motherboard as a USB yep. chip. I guess the the lack of I mean the lack of of chipset integration would be a real deal killer for Intel mm -hmm. in terms of motherboards. Because I can't imagine Intel bothering to put it. I can't imagine Intel with the with their sort of efficiency on motherboard design would ever put an extra chip if they could avoid it. But once you start playing around with USB 3.0, on one hand it's like it's not going to make me print any faster. It's not going to help with network right. speeds. It's not going to help yada yada yada. It's a long list, but it's like if you're pulling a lot of photos off of a digital camera, if you work with raw photos, if you're moving, you know, if you're backing up data onto a hard drive, if you're imaging stuff like US 3.0 yep. is really attractive, especially if you're moving like big video files. You know, I want it to, I want it on my iPhone so it could, it will take this, you know, it'll cut the sync times down by like a fifth. Excuse me, it'll, be it'll, nice? the sync times will be one fifth of what they would be on USB 2.0. I would like that very much. And, and <laughs> you know, I mean, Lightpeak promises to pretty much double the theoretical throughput of USB 3.0, which means we could potentially have double the throughput in real world numbers, which would be kind of cool. Right. Uh, I mean, I did exactly that. I had an external, had to take a bunch of benchmarks with me on a trip. Basically hooked up the machine to you. You know, I've got USB three on my machine, and the, the the machine I was testing on actually had USB three, and we copied, you know, twenty gigabytes of data from from the external drive to the other one, you know, at seventy or eighty megabytes a second, as opposed to twenty or fifteen megabytes a second. That makes a dramatic difference in how much time I am sitting there twiddling my thumbs. <laughs> actually, work done. Maybe that's not as common as as. Uh, you know, we might like to believe that people are trying to do that, right. but I think it's more common than a lot of people think. External backup drives, all kinds of things would be it's, useful. No, it's, it, it would... It. We want okay. Basically, we want everything faster, and we want it now. Speaking of which, <laughs> um, there's kind of the annual sort of news articles. Uh, Sandvine does one, and I want to say I, I of course can't find the article I'm thinking of. Uh, I want to say do 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 do. Um, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Anyhow, I'm going to forget trying to find it. Um, this is the latest article actually was up on Slate.com of all places, but it talks about how on September, uh, Netflix started streaming uh, its streaming movie service in Canada, and the end result was... Um, According to Sandvine, quote, according to Sandvine, a network management company that studies internet traffic patterns, 10% of Canadian internet users visited Netflix.com in the week after the service launched. Um, now, on one hand, um, you know, Canada is roughly has the same population of California, which is to say that it's, you know, the entire population of Canada is 10 percent of the population of the United States. Please don't send me hate mail, Canadians. I, I, I love your country. But um, <laughs> it's interesting, right, because it's I bring that up because there was another report recently. Um, I want to say do, 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 and if I go do do do, do, do one, one more time. Um, are you talking about the Slate article? I mean, it's well, interesting because they're basically a... saying the Netflix. They say the Netflix videos quickly came to dominate broadband lines across Canada, with Netflix subscribers' and bandwidth usage doubling that of YouTube users over the span exactly. of a week. That happened. Um, and it's it's pretty crazy. There was a I want to say Cisco. I, I I'll find the article before we finish the the show today. But they didn't. They do their sort of annual network usage analysis, and it said mm. that streaming video was now 26 percent of all inter internet traffic. Uh, peer to peer wow. was down to 25 percent of all internet traffic, um, and that part of the reason in the year before um, peer to peer traffic was about 36 38 percent of all internet traffic. And part of the reason streaming video video beat it so badly is because so many more people came 
came online and using data in large volumes. And it's really interesting, like you still get a lot of ISPs listening, well, you know, our users rarely, less than 2% of our users ever top, you know, 50 gigabytes monthly or 250 gigabytes monthly. And it's right. interesting how that changes and how radically that changes when you get into moving high definition video over the internet, streaming it, whether it's through iTunes or Netflix or Vudu or Amazon Video On Demand or any other service out there, or even if you're playing gigantic videos off of YouTube, you're talking about make, you know using literally orders of magnitude more data you know, you know what I mean, in the email, it's 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 a couple of kilobits, right? Uh, to, you know, you spend five minutes reading it. You spend five minutes, you know, playing around with the 720p video. You can easily, um, you know, do 100 megabytes. Um, a typical 720p video that's high quality is four and a half gigabytes. A lower quality film will usually be a gigabyte and a half to two gigabytes. So it's wow. interesting to think that finally we're looking at uh, our, net for our network infrastructure really being tested um, and our, our, our ISP bandwidth caps if you're laboring under that one. Um, anyhow, I thought it was an interesting article and, and something to think about like, hmm, you know, are ISPs upgrading? Are the backbones going to be stressed? Is there enough dark fiber to bring online that are, is actually going to be to do a good job in the backhaul in between the ISPs? I'm, I'm actually, and of course I make my living, you know, doing Texel and AC Nation, moving right, those across yeah. the internet. So I obviously have a vested interest. And also I love watching movies. And the higher resolution and the more detail and the higher the bandwidth, the happier I am. So this is going to be fun to watch. Also, be you know, if the, if the adoption rate keeps spiraling up with Google TV and you have the, the next generation Apple TV, Roku's box, the boxy mm -hmm. box is showing up next week. Um, it'll be interesting to see if maybe video becomes like double the traffic of peer to peer. And there's also some, you know, some suggestions that peer to peer traffic starting to taper off a little bit just because like LimeWire going down and the and the fear factor from lawsuits. So it'll be fun to watch. <laughs> Uh, another news story you put in here was iFixit, who does great, iFixit.com does a lot of really interesting like tear teardowns of uh, the high-tech gadgets pretty much yeah. as soon as they're out. Case in point, today the uh, Microsoft Connect launched. Um, uh, if you've never heard of a, a Microsoft Connect, <laughs> you're, you're not attached to the internet, but it's uh, a gaming controller for the Xbox 360 that doesn't require, you know, you, you monitors your body movements right. and all this kind of stuff. The interesting part to me is looking at the teardown. I counted no less than nine microprocessors, sensor controllers, or um, let's see, stereo, what well, do got? Stereo uh stereo ADCs with microphone preamps integrated yes. onto this tiny little device. Plus, they've got like two cameras and an IR projector. I mean, it's an interesting. I love watching teardowns to see how they're implementing hardware design. But this, the Kinect, it's really funny. Like Microsoft's talking about spending a half billion dollars because they want every Xbox 360 owner to have a Kinect and start. You know, I think Leo was talking about right before the live show started. Leo was 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 online and basically saying like, my Kinect is here. It's going into the living room. I won't be back to the cottage for two weeks. Have a great time, because um, he's going to be you know jamming on Kinect games. <laughs> <laughs> but it's you know it's a it's a very surprisingly dense piece of hardware inside of there in terms of the yeah. number of chips, the number of cameras. Yeah, there you can see the the IR projector and the two cameras inside of there, um, the microphones. Anyhow, I, and I just my favorite I just, picture is uh, is the top one on page three where they compare it to uh, Johnny Five. <laughs> there is a distinct it's resemblance short on that one. Movies. It does. It does look kind of like it. They've got some side by sides of that. It's that's pretty funny. Um, so not. A, I mean, obviously, it's not a, like a review right. of the connect or anything like that. But uh, if you want to go see the insides of things, and it's really interesting, they do a really good job of taking it all apart and letting you see all the guts inside. Uh, definitely, yeah. definitely take a look <laughs> at that. Yeah. And if you've never heard of iFixit, um, you probably never watched Texillo, but they teach you how to how to you know upgrade and replace damaged parts on iPhones. And um, boy, there's a there's a word in here where my phone name should belong. You know, iPhones, iPods, various <laughs> other devices. And they're actually they've recently expanded to move beyond. Traditionally, they were an Apple centric community, you know, helping you do DIY repair on Apple products. But they've moved beyond that. Um, into lots and stuff, game console repair, uh, lots and lots of more uh, phone brands, cameras, and all sorts of interesting stuff. So I'm a huge fan of iFixit.com, so I figured I'd toss that one out there. Definitely. All right, let's see. Before we get into, uh, we've got some emails and some Twitter questions. We actually got uh, a couple, I actually got one really good YouTube video question, but it was like almost three <laughs> minutes long, so I asked him to uh, make his question more concise. We'll, we'll get to that next week. Before we get to that, I do want to thank uh, a new sponsor 
to the TWIT network, including This Week in Computer Hardware. That is the AARP Auto Insurance Program from the Hartford. Um, for audience members over the age of 50, which I am not, Patrick, <laughs> you are not. Closing in on it, but I've, I've got a decade to go. That's My good. mother, That's however, good. is over 50. <laughs> there you go. Uh, the AARP Auto Insurance Program uh, from the Hartford can save you $384 on auto insurance. With more than 3 million AARP members who are already enjoying the benefits of this program, including lifetime renewability, lifetime repair guarantee, and a six-point claim guarantee. Customers describe the claims experience as fast, easy, and outstanding. Check them out today and get an eight-minute quote. Go to aarp.thehartford.com slash podcast. Again, the URL is aarp.thehartford.com slash podcast. And we thank them for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. Should we fire up Seth's email? Let's do <laughs> Email, well, basically Seth says, I don't really know much about graphics cards, and I'm looking to build a new PC, and I'm looking at graphics cards, GPUs, between $250 and $300. I found two up on Newegg. One's NVIDIA, the other is AMD. They're both Asus. Sorry, I lost my place in the question there. Uh, one is NVIDIA, <laughs> the other is AMD. <laughs> also because, you know, I still think of AMD as being a company with another name. Um, but... ATI is gone. They're both Asus mm -hmm. and exactly the same price, and the specs are pretty close. Which one would be a better to go with in the long run? I don't do a lot of gaming now, but I want to be able to do some with no problems. I am building a recording workstation for audio, so I want the ability to do multiple monitors, at least two at first. I am also not opposed to adding a second graphics card later to increase performance. And I'm willing to spend a little above my price range before we really impact performance significantly. Love the show. Keep up the good work. Um, I, first of all, i got to say, if you're, if you're getting into sort of recording engineering, uh, I would probably spend no money on the graphics card. Um, you know, the, the ATI cards, excuse me, the AMD cards that allow you to do the triple head would be cool if you plan on expanding to like three 30-inch monitors for your giant home recording setup. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would spend a lot of money on... Uh, hard drives or hard drive space um, if you're doing a lot of recording uh, and memory, lots and lots of memory and lots and lots of CPU followed by uh, microphones uh, and your your digital analog or analog to digital converter for capturing and uh, your audio data. Um, but I don't know. It, it just seems like if you're not a gamer, spending 250 to $300 on a GPU seems like an extravagance, um, especially if you're going to start gaming later, you can buy a $100, $150 card now. And then if you find yourself butting up against performance restrictions, you'll probably be able to buy a, a, a second $150 card that'll double your performance. Um, right. I don't know. You, you think I'm insane at this point? <laughs> I yes I, I I lean more towards graphics than you do. You definitely right. lean more towards audio than I do. Um, if if the if the definite goal of the system is an audio recording workstation, I, I think you're right though. It does pay um, to to really lean towards a high end audio card as uh, as well. I'm not saying mm -hmm. you you can't have both. Obviously, you can do both. He says he doesn't do a lot of gaming now, but he wants to be able to do uh, some gaming in the future without any problems. Right. Now, the two cards that he that he sent the link to, uh, which is a really good idea by the way, if you've got a couple of items, he sent a Newegg product compare URL, which kind of right. puts things side by side for us when we're looking at it. It's a Radeon 5850 and a GeForce GTX 470, uh, priced identically at 259 uh, or 239 with the rebate. Uh, even shipping was within 13 cents of each other or something like that. So, um, you know, like, like you said, both these cards are going to be good performers. If you mm -hmm. want to do triple monitor, you'll be able to do three monitors out of the AMD card. You won't, you'll be able to do two out of the GTX 470. I'd so say the GTX 470 is probably a better performing card than the Radeon HD 5850 at this point. Right. Not by a whole lot, but at least by a little bit. Um, the 5850 is going to use less power and be uh, a little bit cooler. So if you're worried about having too many hard drives, uh, as well as high-end sound cards and that kind of stuff going on in the system, that might be something to consider. I would say today, if I had to choose between these two cards, I would probably maybe go for the GTX 470. Uh, again, because I kind of lean towards gaming graphics performance uh, and two monitors seems to be enough for most people. Uh, right. Even if you're doing a, you know, a lot of kind of editing and, and that kind of stuff. All of our editing workstations here are all two displays as well. So that's, that's probably what I would lean towards of those two options. But I, I think Patrick has a valid point there that 
you know, if you're if you're kind of on a tighter budget, spending two hundred and fifty dollars on a graphics card might not be necessary for you if you're right. really doing minor gaming um, and heavy audio editing. Yeah, it's just I, I just I hate to see somebody spend all that money that could be thrown at RAM or a hard drive or upgrading the audio right. interface or or buying a stack of of Sure SM58s because it's like the generic you know microphone that everybody starts out with. Um, just saying, you know, because okay. in six months for two hundred fifty dollars you'll get a much more badass GPU. But. That's true. That always happens. Let's see, we got an email from Lindsay about a netbook for mom. First of all, thank you for a great show. I enjoy listening to it immensely as computer hardware is one of my passions. Uh, let's see. I, she is a sysadmin and a general geek. Loves to tinker with computers and often do random stuff like rip apart old hard drives and turn them into clocks. That's actually pretty cool. Hmm. Try, to, try to keep up on all the hardware out there. Uh, just because she enjoys it. However, there's a bit too much for one person to keep up on, so the netbooks out there have escaped me. And the tech support for my, or she says, I'm the tech support for my family who live 500 miles away. This year, my mom has asked for a netbook. She really only needs it to play Farmville uh, and to organize pictures in Picasa. Looking for something that won't break the bank, sub $350 is, is better. Running Windows 7 would be a plus, as that's what I have installed on her home computer. She's familiar with it. Also, hmm. light with an easy-to-use touchpad would be a huge plus since she has uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, said she's looked at normal places, Asus, Dell, HP, Acer, but there's an overwhelming amount of options and comparisons out there. So what advice could we offer her? Uh, I've had pretty good luck. I, I own two Dell Mini netbooks. Um, neither one of them I have used very much since I started carrying around an iPad uh, because I like the navigation software and being able yep. to use the touch screen on the iPad a lot better. There is a Farmville application for the iPad. Uh, I have never <laughs> touched it, but I'm just saying uh, the iPad is probably just more say. than Lindsay wants to spend. Um, and I'm not yeah. sure how using the touchscreen interface would work with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, uh, but I also yeah, can't imagine either. typing with rheumatoid arthritis. So that might be a question for people out in the Twitch audience to address. Um, but yeah, um, Dell Outlet. Tell you, can, oop, go ahead. I was going to say, I tell you, there's one um, that one of our guys at Peace Perspective reviewed a, a, a model of recently, and it's an Acer Aspire One, mm -hmm. but it actually also uses a very an AMD model. Yeah, this one uses an AMD Athlon 2 Neo processor, which is AMD's kind of low-end processor mm -hmm. competitor to the Atom platform, and it's a little bit better performing than the Atom cores are. Not a whole lot, but it's a little bit better. Right. But it offers similar battery life and that kind of stuff. And I'm looking at uh, an Acer Aspire 1. It's the um, K1, let's see, it uses the K125 processor. The model number is too long for me to name off here. Uh, <laughs> AO521-3782. It's $339. So it's kind of right at the top of that $350 price limit. It's got Windows 7 starter on it, uh, it but it does have um, 1024 by 600 display. Uh, Looks like it's got two gigs of RAM on there. It's it's a it's a pretty good pretty good machine. You know when you're talking about sub three hundred fifty dollars, you right. know you're really looking at atom based processors or atom class performance processors. One to two gigs of performance, not a whole lot there. Windows seven, I'm looking. It's they're almost all Windows seven starter, um, which she would be familiar with, but it has a little bit of a kind of a. Um, bottleneck on it there. The Ion-based uh, notebooks are also pretty good. 12-inch Asus EPCs, the, C, the right. C Shell brand is pretty good. You get a um, little bit higher resolution screen, two gigs of memory on that, 250, 250 gig hard drive, and uh, the new Atom in-series processors. And that's 399 so it's a little bit outside that limit. But those are kind of like the higher class of, of netbook machines. It's really unfortunate that Intel and Microsoft still seem to be working together and, and leaving that one gigabyte cap in place on netbooks. They've created a sort of artificial distinction between netbooks and real notebooks because there's absolutely no reason you couldn't stuff uh, easily stuff two gigabytes or three gigabytes or four gigabytes of memory on a netbook, or at least there shouldn't be. Um, i got to say yeah. that the Acer Aspire 1, um, if, yeah, see, I'm looking at one that's up on Costco. 
and it's got a built-in uh, card reader, which is awesome. But I'm not seeing the Ion chipset on that one. I would definitely, I would definitely say if if you think your mother might be interested in watching a video on your netbook, which can be very mm -hmm. compelling for because it's, you know, there's this small thing they sit nicely in your lap. It's a good break from Farmville. Um, I would definitely, <laughs> uh, I would definitely try to get one with the Ion video uh, or or basically uh, Nvidia Ion video graphics because they do a, uh, it does offer a huge boost in video playback performance and takes yep. the takes it off the GP or excuse me takes it off the CPU which is really nice yep. um, yeah I just wish I'm just I, I gotta say I really wish the one gigabyte cap that most of the vendors are putting in place would vaporize and go away well like uh, I said that that Asus one actually has two gigs on it okay so it looks like some of the higher-end ones they might be finally doing away with that so cool keep an eye Good. out but I think most of those are gonna be a little bit over the 350 bucks so uh, Twitter show <laughs> we got a excuse me uh, uh, at slowly but surely from Twitter emails at Ryan Trout at Patrick Norton is Blu-ray now viable for backup of data? How worried should I be about bit run? I appreciate your hard work. Thank you, man. Um, Blu-ray's always been uh, viable for backup of data. Um, the drives are a lot less expensive now, so that makes it much more affordable. The trick with BitRot um, is finding archival grade disks. And that's an interesting thought um, because I know Rico and Kodak are kind of the, the market leaders of doing what they call archive quality uh, DVD drives or DVD disks for backup. And that's where things get really interesting. Um, and I also got to say, be very cautious who you buy from because in a lot of cases, when you get like, I'm going to buy Max L's giant stack of cheap Blu-rays, uh, or I'm going to buy the giant stack of house brand cheap Blu-rays or DVD uh, discs from my local super, you know, whatever it is, whether it's your, your, you know, the local Office Mart or the Costco or Walmart. Right. A lot of the brands you see, you know, Sony's probably making their own. Rico's definitely making their own. Codex definitely making their own. Um, you have to be really careful because and basically the, the, the cheap giant stack of discs is usually somebody's lowest price uh, bid from however many vendors are out there making discs. So you can end up with really, way, you know, the, the, basically the lots will be different from purchase to purchase. And mm. the, the, the level of bit rot uh, will be vastly different. Probably five years ago, a German magazine noticed that they were having DVD bit rot as quick as nine to 18 months in the life of a disc. That's wow. seriously bad for long-term archival storage. If yeah, you're no doing kidding. a thing where you're you're rotating backups on like a three-week, one-month, two-month basis, you're probably not going to notice anything. Um, but I would look around for archival gold races. I'm trying to see if, if Rico or... Um, Kodak does an archival grade. Um, I'm not seeing grade. anything like listed specifically as archival grade yet. Um, uh, Delkin Devices uh, has uh, like what they call archival gold. Um, they're claiming a 200-year archival longevity rating. And I also I should also point out that that if you're not going to keep these in a cool, temperature-regulated, dark place. Um, there is no point in, in buying archival grade discs because if you put it, you uh, know, it doesn't help. If you're going to take your DVD and leave it on a desktop or put it in a room that gets up to 125, you know, don't put these in the attic <laughs> where it gets to 150 degrees in the in the hot Texas sun. Don't put, yeah. don't leave them in the car, you know, where the inside of the car gets up to 200 degrees. Don't leave them, you know, anywhere where things get hot. You want them in a cool mm. room. You want them in a dark room because light and heat are the incredible enemies of uh, of CD and DVD. DVD and, and Blu-ray longevity. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I don't know. Delkin's claiming a 200-year archival grade. Um, verbatim, that's DVDs. That's not going to help us out. I wonder, is, is, I'm trying to find out Kodak's doing a Kodak Blu-ray disc. Kodak's usually pretty good if they have an archival grade. Um, I got to tell wow. you, uh, the first thing I thought when I got this question was uh -huh. I looked at the cost per gigabyte for mm -hmm. uh so what are we talking about 10 pack of discs i mean if, <laughs> even if we look at the cheap ones 25 bucks for 10 bdrs right uh, f so that's what we're we talking about mm, a quarter per gig or something like that okay so that's still a little bit less i was thinking it might, it's more uh cost efficient to like buy a bunch of like 200 gig hard drives if you find like a 10 <laughs> A 10 pack of Western Digital or Seagate or something like right. really cheap hard drives. Um, you know, 
I know Leo does that, right? He's got the stack of one terabyte drives just going across, going across the office there. Well, there's a lot uh -huh. of people. I mean, some of the people I've spoken to who spend way too much time dealing with hard drives suggest that hard drives can have inherent bit rot issues if the hard drive isn't exercised mm. on a regular basis. Because That's if the weird. data isn't sort of, it, it, it's funny. It's like a feature they built into um, some of the higher end, uh, some of the higher end uh, Drobo boxes that it basically it you know goes through and rewrites the data periodically so that the 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 magnetic fields on the disk don't get softer over time. Um, hmm. You know how much of a real world concern that is. I don't know, but I've I've, yeah. I've seen. I, I know people who do data recovery that actually are like I wouldn't lock a hard drive in a drawer for ten years and then go back and you know try to read the uh, information. It, it, it's really tempting. You know, for me, it's really tempting to use some type of online backup service, whether it's Carbonite, uh, who's obviously mm -hmm. been a sponsor of us in the past, or or yep. one of the other services, because then you don't have to deal with bit rot. You don't have to deal with what happens if my house gets flooded or burned down or swallowed in an earthquake. Um, you don't have to deal with managing giant piles of media. Um, you have to trust that the giant vendor in, in, out in the cloud is actually competent in doing their, their job. Um, <laughs> You know, and and you know, and and there isn't somebody that's going to be like sneaking into your data. Although in most cases, right. they actually do encrypt your data as you write it up to the cloud. Um, but all of that said, like personally, I think online backup uh, is probably a, a, a really strong thing people should be considering. Um, you know, look for an archival grade disc if you're going to be backing it or, or if you're going to be backing up to a Blu-ray or a DVD or a CD, um, look for what they call an archival grade disc um, because they're basically engineered to for the maximum longevity and storage is critical for optical discs for long-term data storage. And also inspect them every so often because it's really sad to find out in a year, you know, I don't, I don't expect Blu-rays to start fading out in a year, but it all depends on what you're writing on and whether it uh, lives up to the quality you'd like to see. Uh, also, buying online usually makes for much better deals. <laughs> <laughs> Always. Uh, we got a Twitter question here from, I'm going to pronounce this, Jesus D. Says, at Ryan Shroud and Patrick Norton, what Black Friday deals are you guys excited for when it comes to computer hardware? Oh, boy. You know, nobody's talking too much about them this early, which I was kind of shocked uh, about. Do, we, are um, you, do you usually see, like, Black Friday deals on computer hardware? Usually I think of TVs and consumer electronics and that kind of stuff. I don't really think <laughs> of, you know, like hard drives and that kind of stuff. Maybe monitors, but not, uh, like, hard drives and components. Usually because if you look at someplace like Newegg, the prices are right. on a pretty small margin as it is that they don't really offer a whole lot of huge Black Friday deals. But. They usually have some sort of, like at some of the computer stores around here, they usually have some kind of loss leader that makes you contact. I, like, I, I, I just, I don't leave the house on Black Friday. And if I do, I, I head in the opposite direction of any mall or shopping area. Cause yeah, I it just, you know, it, I, I played <laughs> rugby for nine years, man. I've been beaten up enough and getting my ass kicked by a little old lady trying to buy the Susie Wetz itself doll. Um, it's just a, you know, it's just an ass kicking I don't need. Um, it's really, you know, the flip side is, you know, um, where is it? Some of the websites are covering that. Like, it's kind of funny because the, the newspaper flyers for Black Friday get printed early. Yep. So usually about a week out, you'll see some deals. I mean, GPS devices were on the under, you know, decent car GPSs were under $100 last year. Um, you know, I don't think hard drives can get much cheaper. There's going to be some good deals on Nope. <laughs> There's going to be some good deals on desktops. There's going to be some great deals on HDTVs. Although, whether or not the great deal from your local electronics store will match the Amazon deal or the Amazon return policy uh, I would check that before you uh, before you purchased one but like mm. Best Buy's uh, starting November 5th is the best basically Best Buy's decided to make it the month of Black Friday you know <laughs> so they've got like a Sony PSP Go uh, their house brand HD camcorder um, a gateway e-machines 15.6 inch laptop with 2 gigabytes of RAM and Windows 7 yeah. 280 bucks Samsung Blu-ray player 120 bucks ACC Droid incredible 99 99, which I'm not really impressed with because a friend of mine just got one for like a penny with a new two-year deal at Costco the other week. Um, yeah, exactly. That's kind of my know. impression about <laughs> most of this when we're talking like computer hardware. Is it's You can go to promotions.newegg.com and I think they have a Black November starts now 
phenomenal right. Black Friday deals all month long. And some of them, you know, sound pretty good, you know, because <laughs> Newegg also sells consumer electronics. They have Garmin right. Navigator or Garmin Navigation Units, Acer monitors. But, you know, a lot of the stuff like uh, an Intel Core i7 950 processor going from 299 to 274. You know, that's a good sale, but it's not like <laughs> I, I'm, I'm ordering two of them right now or anything. So, yeah. But, you know, it's it, and the other thing is, you know, a lot of people are moving to online shopping. Um, yep. It's, it's, and it's nice to see Newegg kind of getting into the spirit of saving us money because uh, I'm I cheap. Can, I can support that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, we have a correction from Daniel and several others. I was just listening to the most recent episode of Twitch and heard you say that Western Digital Green Drives would be just fine for use in RAID. He says this is actually not correct. Per the Western Digital website, only the RAID edition drives can be used. Uh, okay, this is Daniel speaking. Um, because these drives contain a feature called time-limited error recovery. When the drive sectors go bad, the hard drive will internally remap sectors. During this operation, the drive will not respond to the RAID controller and can time out, causing the drive to be dropped from the array and require the user to rebuild the array even though the drive is just fine. TLER forces the drive to respond to the RAID controller so it will not be dropped. This feature was at one time included in all Western Digital drives. However, the more recent drives, starting sometime in late 2009, have TLER disabled in the firmware. Western Digital also used to provide a utility that would enable TLER in these drives. However, newer drives also have the ability to enable TLER blocked in all drives except for the RAID edition. If you look at the product pages in the Ideal 4 section under the Features tab for the Caviar Green and Caviar Black drives, you'll see that Western Digital says these drives are suitable only for use in RAID 0 and 1 configurations, which I personally uh, highly recommend you avoid like the plague, uh, <laughs> RAID 0 more than RAID 1, but not right. other RAID configs such as RAID 5 and 6, which are the good RAIDs that you do want due to the lack of TLER. I can also tell you that even RAID 1 will not work. I had a Caviar Black drive in RAID 1 with a Seagate drive, and after only a few weeks of use, the drive would regularly drop from the array and require a rebuild. Bottom line, don't use Caviar Green or Black drives for a RAID array. It's just a matter of time before they drop out of the array because they aren't responding. Well, so the reason the my... reason I put this in here is actually I got, I think we got four emails that specify this same feature to some degree or another. Um, and it's it's an interesting point, right? I mean, I've used mm -hmm. green and black drives and RAID arrays right. for uh, extended periods of time with no issue. <laughs> However, I have also had points where uh, on particular, not this current system, but on my older system where mm -hmm. I was using Western digital drives or I think Seagate drives as well that uh, would suddenly drop one from right. the array and i was thinking i was running raid five at the time and you know you do a rebuild on that drive and it rebuilds it slowly but surely and it seems to be working fine and this kind of explains what that what that might have been in that effect i'm guessing by the start of the when you read the question that you also have had positive experiences with green and black and all other types of hard drives and arrays yeah I, i've been buying green and black drives and nothing else uh primarily green drives for for uh, pretty much every free NAS, um, yeah, free NAS Unraid or uh, any other server build or Drobo box I've been using for the last couple of years. So I'm a little, you know, Daniel does say this is something recently that they've been eliminating the TLER mm -hmm. stuff from the less expensive drives. But yeah, I'm trying to find something up on the freenas.org website. Um, because I got to be honest with you, this was uh, this is interesting. Uh, I want to like call up the people I know at Western Digital and be like WTF question mark because I don't want to <laughs> buy one of their RAID edition drives. Um, yeah, you know, I, I agree. You know what I mean, if if consumer drives are good enough for Google, and obviously Google's working on a slightly different scale and a slightly different level of parity than than I am at home, but you know, if 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 out of the box, you know, over the shelf consumer drives are good enough for Google's entire hardware infrastructure, I think they should be good enough for mine. But it would be funny. It's like, okay, if you know, if Western Digital is doing this and trying to force us to the RAID drives, and now I'm looking for you know, uh, WD RAID uh, drives up on Newegg.com. Um, yeah, I'm, I, you know, I, it, it makes me go, okay, is it time to go back to c or uh, one of the a friend of mine who does drive recovery is basically like, uh, he's buying all Hitachi drives at home now because he's not seeing hmm. any Hitachi drives coming in any significant volume into his business uh, for data recovery. <laughs> right. Um, it's interesting. I, I was looking around at system searching and there's some 
uh, places where you can still download this utility that apparently Western right. Digital doesn't offer anymore uh, called WDTLER, which will allow you to enable or disable that feature on mm -hmm. Caviar SC, SC16 GPs or Raptor hard drives and that kind of stuff. So search around if that's something you're interested in. It's a good point. I think um, I will bug our storage guy, Alan, about that this week, See, get his kind of professional feedback and, and uh, opinion on it. And uh, we will report back next week. Maybe we even have a cameo with them. So yeah, we're looking at 130 bucks for a one terabyte Western Digital RAID drive, RAID specific drive, mm -hmm. um, the RE3, which is approximately twice, more than twice what one terabyte drives are costing in the green format around here. Okay, so that is an um, important question. So it is a very important question, I think. We will find out. Let's see, we got another email here from AJ mm -hmm. about TV tuners. It says, I'm going to be showing my wife's cousin how to build his own PC. And he mentioned cool. he would like to add a TV tuner to the system. Last time I've ever dealt with something like that was back in the days of the Radeon 9600 All-in Wonder card. I remember those. Those were, those, were, those were nice. I hooked up cable to it, but hardly used it. I, re I would really like to throw a decent GPU in his build for gaming. So what should I look for in tuners? Any help? would be great. Hopog. We, te we <laughs> tend to bring that name up a lot, don't we? Well, I mean, you know, there's there's like K-World makes uh, HDTV tuners. Hopog makes HDTV tuners. Um, I, you know, I, 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 you know, you're basically going to buy, I, I prefer the internal cards over the USB cards. I think they deliver yeah. slightly better image quality in most cases. Um, you know, if you need a, 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 a device to capture AD, uh, AD HD, and you want to get around the HDMI HTCP protection, I highly recommend you check out uh, the HD PVR from Hopog, which is a component capture box. It does really good 720p capture. Um, but if you go up to uh, hopog.com, uh, WinTV HVR, um, I think the new one. Yeah, I'm looking the at looking at the Win TV HDV or the 1600, uh, and they're cheap. Um, they're well under 100 bucks on Newegg.com, and you you put yep. one in, you attach an external antenna to it, or you attach the cable box feed to it, and you'll get basically what you can get off the cable box. Uh, I, I like using them with over-the-air uh, antennas because the quality of the over-the-air video is so spectacular. If you're in an urban area, not a rural area, and you've got right. decent uh, uh, television, basically if you have t decent television reception where you are. Um, I mean, because that's the flip side is if they want to use, you know, Windows Media Center and Windows 7 to build a, a, a home theater PC, which I highly recommend. The downside is if you don't have a cable card adapter in your PC, you are not going to be able to get most of the interesting channels and, and use Windows Media Center as a DVR for most of the interesting cable channels. Oh. So that would be something if, you know, if, if your, uh, your wife's cousin has uh, <laughs> cable and wants to you know, do the DVR thing um, and has, has cable television wants to do the DVR thing, I would tell your wife's cousin to call up the local cable company and see if they uh, can do a cable card for him. Right. My buddy Robert Heron, uh, the guy I do AC Nation with, finally got his CTON tuner, which is basically will allow him to record four HD streams simultaneously off his Comcast cable. Uh, I was really so. looking at those last week. They've Well, they finally started shipping. He's been waiting yep. for this thing for months. How long until <laughs> we see a review from him, or at least preliminary uh, should be review? On, on next week's HD Nation. Okay. So that one uh, I'm this, really curious about, curious about. That's a little bit more expensive in the world of a of yes. a TV tuner cards and that kind of stuff. So yes, but but a, a basic cable card uh, adapter should be a little bit less expensive. But yeah, hop hog for a for an over the air TP tuner, you're going to need a cable card adapter uh, if you want to work with your cable box. All right, Ethan, we got one more email oops, to get sorry. to. <laughs> Whoops, I'm sorry. I said, but you think we just got one more email to get to? Sorry about that. I I had a. Uh, Apparently somebody stepped on the Ethernet here. Email from <laughs> Ethan talking Wi-Fi versus Ethernet. I was wondering how you would have a better Ethernet connection using Wi-Fi or a 20-foot long Ethernet cord. Uh, well, gigabit Ethernet rocks. It doesn't matter if you turn on the microwave. It doesn't matter if the cat sits on your antenna. It doesn't matter if the neighbors are all using the same channel in the Wi-Fi spectrum. It doesn't matter if you're living in a city and there's 150 uh, wireless routers in the surrounding 100 yards, which I've actually run into in some of the parts of San Francisco I've lived in and some of the places I've stayed with friends in New York City. Because um, basically the more, you know, 2.4 gigahertz is kind of like a junkyard for the FCC. It's an open spectrum, which means... <laughs> 
<laughs> microwaves run on 2.4 gigahertz. Weird wireless television connection devices run on it. Wi-Fi runs on it. Uh, there's there's the number of 2.4 gigahertz devices out there is kind of spectacularly. Re it, it's just there's a ridiculous number of devices stuffing things onto the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. So. I am a huge fan of gigabit Ethernet um, because it's faster, it's more robust. You never have to worry about you know wireless connectivity issues. Right. It never really times out. Um, <laughs> it doesn't get hacked. It. Uh, you know, I'd say I, if you I, can I, run a twenty foot cable and not trip and kill your spouse, or even even significantly aggravate your spouse, that is always worth it to go wired. Yeah, um, and it's you know it's it's one less device that's sucking up the bandwidth from your uh, uh, from your router. <laughs> true, true. Um, All right, now before we close out the show, which I guess we'll say here, uh, um, if you want to send us emails, Twitch at peace, Twit. No, hold on, Twitch at twit.tv is the correct email address. Um, also. Uh, like I said, we did get uh, a YouTube question, which we're going to get to next week in a slightly shortened version. So if that's something you'd be interested in doing, we, we have no problems playing those back as well. It could be fun and interesting. Um, Twitter, at Patrick Norton, at Ryan Shrout. You can direct questions to us there as well. Before we get to the real closing of the show, Patrick, I did want to give something away, if that's okay. Absolutely. So ECS sent us a couple of motherboards uh, to give away to Twitch listeners and viewers. This one we're going to give away is the ECS Black Series A890GXMA. So this is a an AMD platform motherboard 890GX chipset SB850 Southbridge, so it does support SATA 6G. Um, I believe this has, let's see, it's got HDMI output, VGA, DVI output, mm -hmm. uh, eSATA, lots of USB ports, um, uh, overclockable system uh, because it is the black series it's got dual gigabit ethernet supports ati crossfire technology as well nice. phenom phenom 2 processors athlons as well i believe yeah all, all, anything that's am3 capable will fit in here and uh, we're gonna make this nice and simple we're gonna give away this motherboard to a twitch listener all you have to do is email twitch at twit.tv make sure this is the important part subject line contest just, just the word contest, subject line. Uh, and put in there in the email, what component in your system are you planning on upgrading or buying anew this holiday season? What, are you building a whole new system? If not, which, which component are you most worried about upgrading? Your storage, your graphics, uh, your audio, your motherboard, the whole thing, your display. Uh, maybe your keyboard or mouse is really annoying and you got to get an upgrade to those as well. That's probably my most frequently purchased item as well. Uh, and we will uh, randomly draw one from that list of email recipients and uh, send you a brand new ECS 890GX motherboard. So we thank them for that. It's very cool. Sweet. All right. I think that's going to wrap up the show, though, for us, isn't it, Patrick? I think it is. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been watching Twitch this week in Computer Hardware, episode 94. We will be back, same channel, same time, next week.